this. So we're going to talk about safe and effective hospital discharges. So uh, what we're going to focus in on are what are the current problems related to hospital discharges, what are the barriers that prevent us from doing it well, what is an effective discharge process, and at the end we're going to try to link um, behaviors that we're striving with milestones that we're hoping you all accomplish over the course of your training. Okay, so the problem is that one in five of our Medicare patients, which is the group that we have the most information on, they're readmitted within 30 days of, of discharge. In case you don't know, there are a number of conditions that if we discharge them and they are readmitted within 30 days, the hospital is penalized, not just for, say, heart failure, uh, readmissions. If you discharge someone with heart failure and they come back two weeks later because they were hit by a truck, that still counts as a readmission. So hospitals are very concerned about readmissions in this population. We do know that more than 20 percent of our patients do have a preventable adverse event within the month after they're discharged. And in one study, they found that 41 percent of discharge Patients had test results that were not back by the time we discharged the patients, uh, and yet uh, the vast majority of them, um, their PCPs had no idea that those tests were pending. Ten percent of them actually required an intervention. So, uh, as you can see, oops, two thirds of two thirds of the PCPs had no idea that this important test might still be pending. And lastly, uh, a big problem is that. Patients in general are often unaware why they were in the hospital, what medications they're to take, what they're for. So that can result in non-adherence, complications, and readmissions. Okay. Hospital discharges are an extremely complex process, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, and unintended readmission is one of the at potential adverse effects, but not the only one. Uh, patients who don't uh, know what their follow-up care plans are, if they're unclear about that, they don't know uh, who's supposed to do what. We don't know who's supposed to do what. We don't, often don't ask the patients or their caregivers, are they going to be able to handle what we're asking them to handle when the patient actually ends up getting home. Our care is fragmented, and when it's fragmented and we have poor team coordination, more things will fall through the cracks. And lastly, uh, we need to put things in a patient-centered approach with respect to their medication and their access to treatment so that we can make sure that our therapy that we're intending be implemented actually takes place. Okay, so there are a number of areas where barriers to this process exist. They're us, the medical team. They're hospital-related. They're patient factors. And lastly, and maybe the most important, is failure to communicate across many of these areas. Okay, so medical team-related barriers to effective discharges we're busy. We were admitting new patients. Somebody's just crashed. We had a stat response. Those things get our attention often first, and we, we'll, we'll get to discharges later. So it's not necessarily prioritized. Uh, the least experienced member of the team, the intern, is often the person who uh, is in charge of the discharge. So we would like you to learn a little bit about that. We often will get last-minute tests, we obtain them, or last-minute consultations, and we don't necessarily have the results of those when we discharge our patient. Inaccurate medic medicine reconciliation. How many of you have already noticed at University Hospital uh, when the medications are first entered? The nurses often take a shortcut with our current system and just free text, Right. How easy is that for you all to reconcile medications? How many of you reconcile as soon as possible, at least within the first 48 hours? So it needs to be done, needs to be done early, and it needs to be done accurately. On our the last bullet point here, it says discharge medication reconciliation is started on the day of discharge. 
mentioned barriers before hospitals. Our current um, system that we have in place, actually we can't reconcile our medications until the day of discharge. We used to could do it start doing it earlier, but now we can't. So that's that's a barrier, and that's actually not the ideal way to do it. So lack of resources from a hospital's point of view, financial incentives to sustain discharge programs. What if we don't have all of the support staff we need in terms of social workers or case managers, uh, et cetera, to do this effectively? The, the discharge paperwork. So have any of you all printed off your discharge plan after you've typed it up into the computer or look through the old medical records. I can har hardly read it. I don't know how my patients can read it. So uh, it certainly is not targeted to perhaps a low health literacy individual and definitely not to English as a second language. We as clinicians sometimes resist improvements, even if they're for our own good. Okay, patient related. We have a vulnerable population. Even with the Affordable Care Act, many of them still have no uh, primary care physician. They still may not have any insurance, or if they do, they may have high copays, which can be a problem for them uh, in terms of both appointments as well as medications. They may have long wait times to get in. They may have long wait times on the phone to make appointments. We have long wait times trying to help them by making appointments. And lastly, um, um, if we do a late-in-the-day discharge, if they're anxious to get out of the hospital, they may not really be paying attention like it's a last lecture and you're in a hurry to get out. You may not be attentive to what the instructions that are going on at that time. Okay. Poor communication. We have difficulty getting information from the primary care providers, and we don't do such a good job conveying to the primary care provider when we're sending the patient out what's been going on with the patient. Um, we do know um, when we discharge the patients, they often don't know what medications they, that have been prescribed, which ones we've started, which ones we've stopped. They may not know when their follow-up appointments are. And particularly in our population, they may not actually know why they were hospitalized in the first place. Okay, so you all have seen the fishbone. So those barriers that we've talked about are up in here, and it's very complex. And as I put down here, there are many quality improvement project opportunities if anyone wants to explore some of these, because we truly do have a lot of barriers to doing this efficiently. Okay, when the discharge process is improved, um, Patients who do have a clear understanding of what their post-hospitalization care plans are, they are 30% less likely to be readmitted or to return to the emergency department than patients who don't have that information. Now, it is not as evidence established as we like that all of these things individually or in part contribute, but there is some evidence, meta-analysis of randomized control studies only five of 16 randomized studies did show a significant decrease in readmissions. The key with those were they typically were uh, multi-involvement, uh, multiple interventions, not a single intervention to show efficacy. So some of the things that they uh, found, whether uh, in uh, com combined together, focused in on is the discharge instructions that we provide the patient, is it patient-centered? And we'll show some examples of that. Do they receive a post-hospitalization phone call from someone on the team? Have their medications truly been reconciled in an appropriate fashion? Um, is the discharge summary structured, including all the pertinent information, and is it timely for the PCP? Have we planned for all the discharge needs with the help of our social worker to get PT, uh, wheelchair, whatever it is they need? And lastly, uh, have we done a good job communicating uh, between the community and the hospital? Those are uh, effective when used in combination and reducing readmissions. So discharge planning, as I often tell members on my team, 
and, and my ABCs are a little bit different than Dr. Brown's. ABCs, D is how I tell the team. You do your airway, breathing, circulation, and disposition from the moment they hit the door. And I said that before I did this. So you need to be thinking of it very, very early. As soon as you start your HMP and get your treatment plan, we need to be starting our education of the patient, letting them know what we think is going on. And when we establish it, tell them what we definitely know they have. We begin discharge instruction from the beginning. If we've stopped a medication, we need to tell them why we've stopped it and not to restart it. If we start a new medication, it's okay to start teaching them from the beginning. Oh, we, we put you on lisinopril for your blood pressure and your heart failure. Uh, so those kind of stuff. The actual discharge order is here, but then there's a discharge process more discharge instructions, and then the event is followed by their hospital follow-up and hopefully their hospital phone call. Okay. This is probably one of the most important activities that we can do well or we can really blow that can make um, readmission as well as effective communication. The medication reconciliation. Many of our patients have no clue what they're on, why they're on it. Um, I had, it's, it's been a few years back before we use our current system, but, uh, one of my interns in years past did the medications. Patient came in, I'll tell you in a minute. And then at, at the end, they were allowed to just write, resume home medications. Well, one of the home medications that that person resumed was their lisinopril, which is what we had stopped in their hospital because it had caused acute kidney failure. Guess who came back in the hospital again with acute kidney failure? Just because they took the shortcut, you know, you can't do that in our current electronic systems, but just be aware that just because the paperwork doesn't say it doesn't mean the patient won't do it if we haven't explained that very well. So we need to ask patients what barriers do they have? Some of our people can't read. Some of them can't afford them. Somebody else puts the medicines out for them. It could be quite complicated. Uh, they may not know their pre-admission medications, and we may have to call pharmacy, doctor's office, wherever. We need to explain medications, and we don't have to wait till discharge. We can begin that process early. And lastly, of course, we have to review and reconcile the medications before they leave. I'm sure you've all done discharge summaries now, and you know in Net Access there is a template that everyone hopefully um, has and uses. Um, one of the things that I don't think we emphasize enough is how timely those discharge summaries are. The hospital's interested in them being done in a timely fashion because that's how they get paid. But we'll talk about it in a minute, but you've arranged a follow-up for your patient how are you going to get the information about what has happened to the providers who are going to see that patient in follow-up? If you don't dictate till a week after discharge and you've asked them to be seen, there's lag time from the actual dictation to one it's transcribed, and then who knows if it's actually getting to where it's supposed to be getting. So, so it's important that it be done timely and complete, accurate and succinct, really emphasize which medications you discontinued and which medications are new, if there are any diagnostic uh, tests that are pending, we really need to emphasize that. Not only should we take ownership of who on our team is going to follow up on that, but the, the primary care provider who's going to be seeing that patient also needs to know. It's a good idea to let the patient know, too. They can be their own advocate as well. And then I'm going to show you some examples of clear patient instructions as well. Okay, this is just a, in, in table format uh, what I've just said about the discharge summaries. You all know all of these, and I've put these in red because these are, are really important um, that we communicate to the PCP. Okay, so patient care plans are, are actually something that the patient should be given in their hands when they leave, and it conveys all kinds of information. And as I told you before, the ones that we currently have that are printed out from our net access discharge are not very good. But obviously the date of discharge, contact information for us as well as any other, you know, consultants that were uh, following the patient while they were in the hospital, who and what to do, uh, who to call, what to do in the setting of an emergency, meds, tests, follow-up appointments, possibly a calendar if that's appropriate, diet, etc. 
information about their disease. If you're a sophisticated hospital institution, you might include maps for their follow-up appointments and anything else. So I think here's an example um, of um, a patient care plan that is actually pretty good from a visual point of view for patients. It tells them where they're at. This RED stands for re-engineered discharge, um, which I'll show you some more on. The patient's name when they were discharged, who to contact. So, for example, uh, we might have our nurse clinician's uh, office number uh, for contact there if they have any questions. And then for any serious problem, what physician uh, they might have, have uh, access to. You, we need to give them some information, printed information, about their condition. Now, I'll be honest. The nurses do this. I don't know what they actually hand my patient and what they're emphasizing in terms of what medical condition they're teaching the patient on. Probably not the ideal setting. We need to take more ownership of that and at least collaborate with our nurses to see what information, educational information they're planning to give to our uh, patients before discharge. I really like uh, this for patients. They've broken down the medications in a grid in terms of morning, noon, evening, depending on how many times they do it. The first column says what the medication is for. We need to get in the habit when we are writing our prescriptions, we should put uh, COZAR for blood pressure actually on the written prescription so that when it is filled by the pharmacist, they'll write COZAR for blood pressure. And then it tells them how to take it, how often to take it, because that's another opportunity to teach your patient. I don't know what that little pink pill's for. I don't know what that little white pill's for. If if they can read, they can read what's on the pill bottle if we've indicated the indication for the medication. Part of the Patient care plan includes their follow-up appointments. They are asked to bring their discharge plan with them when they go. Tells them what appointments, who, when, where. And then this nice form also includes an opportunity for them to uh, handwrite any uh, questions they want to ask when they do go for their follow-up appointments. Okay. Patient and caregiver communication. We need to, to talk with both the patient and anybody who's going to be helping them be successful in their uh, discharge situation. Um, do they know what's going on? Do they know what their conditions are? Uh, do they know what their diagnosis? Do they know how they're going to be managing it? Do we let the patient and their families know in advance, we're thinking you're going to be in the hospital for three days. Okay, I think you're doing really well. You know, I think maybe you're only going to need here to be here, you know, one more day. I think tomorrow we're going to be able to discharge you. So what are we doing to communicate um, so that their questions can be answered, so that somebody can get the house key, so somebody can be calling for a ride, whatever. So we need that kind of communication on a regular basis. And we need to ask specific questions. What are they going to need at discharge? Are they going to need help getting home? Are they going to need um, a wheelchair? Are they going to need uh, help getting their medication? So anticipate by communicating. Teaching the patient. If uh, Have you all already had your teach-back training? I know the upper levels have. Have the interns or people still missing teach-back, or has everybody had an opportunity to do teach-back? Not yet. Okay, well, you will, so this will introduce uh, it to you a little bit. But part of what we need to do is teach our patients why they were here, what their condition is, how it's being managed. Uh, and using Teach Back, it helps us determine what the health literacy of our patient is, where appropriate it needs to be language and culture adjusted. So what is teach back and the show me method. Well, you start over here with a new concept. You provide some health information, advice, or an instruction uh, on new or change in management. So you, the provider, are going to explain that or demonstrate that to the patient. Then we need to assess the patient's ability to not only recall it, but to comprehend it, and where appropriate, ask them to demonstrate. So, for example, if you were teaching them how to use an inhaler, you'd want them to actually show you how to use it properly. 
after they, they patient has done their interpretation, you clarify or tailor any of the explanation that might need a little bit of tweaking, you reassess it and ask, and then hopefully the patient recalls and comprehends and demonstrates mastery. This might lead to improved adherence and error reduction. One of the things that's very important as part of the teach back, uh, we're not quizzing the patients, we're not, you know, uh, putting them on the spot because they are having trouble remembering, so put it on yourself. Ask it in such a way such as, I want to be sure I didn't leave anything out that I should have told you. Would you tell me what you are to do so that I can be sure uh, you know what's important? Um, I want to know that uh, I did a good job explaining your blood pressure medications because they can be confusing. Can you tell me what changes we made and how you'll n take your medication now going forward? When you go home and your grandchild asks you what the doctor said about your heart, how are you going to explain this to your grandchild? So those are some examples where we take ownership of the teaching and not make it that the patient doesn't understand. It's we didn't explain it well. Being able to repeat doesn't necessarily mean that they comprehend, so sometimes there, there can be some other things going on, uh, including uh, capability. I understand, but am I capable and willing to do what you have asked me to do? So do you see yourself able to follow these instructions? Well, if I'm sending my patient home on Lovenox shots and they totally understood and, and relayed it back to me, but they have no intention whatsoever of giving themselves shots, if I don't ask it in such a way to elicit that, then the patient goes home, not on Lovenox, even though I've prescribed it. I may even have arranged free sample for them, and they're not doing it. So we have to assess their ability and willingness. Do they have functional barriers such as memory, environmental barriers, do they have attitudinal barriers? Uh, and where appropriate, like I said, you have them demonstrate. So you might add, you know, say, uh, the nurse is going to go over and you're going to show her how you're going to give the shot. Okay. One of the things I think and another way with the teach back is uh, three important, ask me three. Before the patient leaves the hospital, can they explain what is their main problem? What do they need to do to manage it? What, why is it important? What happens if I don't do what uh, the doctor asked me to do? Okay. Team communication. We, the physicians, are only a small part, and we may not even be the, the part that spends the most time with the patients. We have our nurses. We have our physical therapy, social worker, case manager, uh, pharmacy. Interprofessional inter team communication prior to and on the day of discharge uh, will expedite uh, an effective process. If we're thinking a person's going to go to the nursing home and the social worker and case manager say, you know, they don't meet any skilled needs and they're not going to qualify, and we've been in our mind thinking, oh, this person's going to a nursing home, and we we just talk to the social worker on the day we think they're ready to leave, then, then we have failed in our communication. Um, what barriers are uh, there to going home? Does the patient need to be switched from IV to oral medications? Do they need a PICC line inserted? Do they need uh, IV lines, central lines removed? So one of the things also is amongst all the team members, we need to be consistent. Um, I can tell you I've had days when I've said, patient's going home, patient's going home, and that can be sabotaged by other team members um, and sometimes really sabotaged. <laughs> so... So we need to communicate, and we need to collaborate. Uh, you can get help from your fellow team members. For example, if you have a pharmacy representative on your team, maybe they can help you do the medication reconciliation and part of the, the education on the new medication and why we stopped the old medication. Um, what can the case manager tell us and the social worker about uh, um, short-term rehab nursing home placement, do they qualify for home services? Um, the nurse may be the only one who knows, well, the patient can't get out of bed. You know, every time they do, they're falling, and we haven't bothered to notice that yet. Um, and collaborate with all members. You know, is our physical therapist and occupational therapist writing in their notes that the patient's not safe to go home? You know, we need to communicate. All right. 
Uh, anticipating post-hospital needs, um, we need to be checking for the readiness. Are they willing? You know, sometimes patients will dig in their heels. They really don't want to go, and, and our education process may uh, not only involve teaching them about their care, but our social worker and case managers may be having to help educate them. Well, Medicare won't pay for you to stay in the hospital, and, you know, if you, so these are the things we're going to do to help you be successful at home. Um, do they need um, help with medications, et cetera? We need to have their follow-up appointments ideally prearranged for them, and we need to make sure that the discharge summary gets to their follow-up provider. There are a variety of ways, and I will be honest, this is one of the areas that I'm still not sure University Hospital is effective at doing, uh, a discharge, uh, getting the discharge summary. Every time you dictate a discharge summary, you need to be indicating who's to receive copies. We do know from the literature, it says, unfortunately, the discharge summary reaches the primary care provider by the first follow-up visit in only 12 to 34 percent of such visits. And the quality may also be substandard, but they aren't even getting the discharge summary. So what is the re-engineered discharge? It's kind of what we've already gone through. It's uh, This is a checklist. Have we done med reconciliation? Uh, is our discharge patient plan Per the national guidelines, have we arranged follow-up appointments? Who's responsible for any tests that are not yet back? Have we arranged appropriate post-discharge? Do they have their oxygen? Do they have their physical therapy? Whatever. Is there a written discharge plan that the patient can read? Do they know what to do if a problem arises? Have we taught them what their problems are and confirmed that they can understand it? communicated with the PCP, hopefully effectively by getting the uh, discharge summary to them in a timely fashion, and made arrangements for someone on the team to do a phone call to the patient in 20, 48 to 72 hours to confirm if any new questions about the hospitalization have popped up that they didn't quite get and they need answered. Okay. Weekends for making follow-up appointments, we still have to make arrangements. Here we typically call the offices on Monday and then recommunicate with the patients, but do have a plan for those folks that are discharged after hours. As I've said multiple times, make sure that pending tests are followed up either by us or by the PCP. And confirm, is the oxygen arranged? Is the durable medical equipment, do they have bandages for their wounds? Whatever it is they need, case managers and social workers can help us make sure uh, that that's all available. Um, okay, we've talked about that. So we're about to squeeze it all in in time. The reason that we're talking about this, not only is it important for our patients, we can reduce morbidity. There's no evidence yet that we definitely reduce mortality, but it's a possibility if someone has enough uh, complicated medical problems. We may be able to reduce discharge summaries, but this is part of uh, your steps moving forward to accomplishing the milestones that we're looking at uh, to show your competency in internal medicine, and we will be looking at, at these things and we're even going to try and develop a mini CEX to help give you all feedback on the actual discharge process uh, to make it easier uh, to move forward and get us all on a standardized kind of same approach 